Hello and welcome back to PaleoCast. I'm Dave Marshall. And I'm Liz Martin. And yes, we have Liz Martin back from uh, Japan. How was your trip? It was good. It was a lot of fun, but it's nice to be back. <laughs> and uh, how's the thesis writing going? Because that, that was why you were there, wasn't it? Yeah. So thesis writing actually went really well. Apparently being completely isolated for three months with nothing else to do gets a lot of writing done. So yeah. hopefully in the next couple of weeks, I'll submit, hoping either next week or the week after. So, uh, Have you still got lots to do? Uh, I'm just kind of waiting on comments on a few final chapters um, and the rest of it's basically all done. So I don't have too much depending on comments. You're in a good place then. I, yeah. I remember for my MSC, I was I was in that place kind of like with five minutes before the deadline. <laughs> yeah, I don't have like a strict deadline. The deadline currently is that I already have a Viva date and so I need to submit enough time before that so I can make the Viva date. And I don't know what that actual strict deadline is, but I'm aiming for six weeks. <laughs> well, good luck in getting that in. Uh, but even though you're writing up, you still managed to find time to record an interview whilst out in Japan. So can you tell us what we're going to be hearing about today? Yeah, so I went to the National Museum of Nature and Science and uh, met up with the head of collections there and basically what this episode what this episode is about is um, going through the Japan gallery so it's kind of a brief introduction to paleontology in Japan and it's a little bit different than usual episodes I guess because we're actually walking through the gallery um, which was a lot of fun but as you'll hear caused a few problems with noise why what was what was happening uh so i went on monday which is actually the day that they're closed to the public so we mm -hmm. thought that that would be perfect because there wouldn't be people around unfortunately because it's closed to the public that's also the day that they do a lot of work in the museum so right. there's a little bit of banging and and stuff as they were actually dismantling an exhibit below us which we didn't know was going to be happening so um typical unfortunately yeah unfortunately there's a little bit of background noise at times but i think it's okay yeah it doesn't it doesn't go on for the whole episode so there's just no. a bit like a third of the way in so stick with it it's not too bad yeah. Um, but so what we've got is kind of like, a, you know, one of those audio guided tours that you can get at the reception of some museums. Is that kind of what we've got? Yeah, it's a little bit like that. It's kind of starting in the at the earliest fossil ever found in Japan and going all the way through to kind of modern cave deposits. So it's walking as a sort of guided tour through the the exhibit, uh, learning about all the different kinds of fossils you can find in Japan. Yeah, it's a really nice change in terms of format, and I think it works quite well. So please let us know what you think and if you'd like any more of this kind of stuff. And speaking of what you guys think about us and how you feel about the show, the Podcast Awards show is coming up again, and it's got a bit of a new format. Can you talk a little bit about that, Dave, and tell us about the new format? Okay, so every year we've been asking you guys to um, effectively vote for us for the podcast award show. It's like the podcast Oscars, if you will. And this year it's a little bit different and it really um, shifts things in, in towards our favour. So before you used to uh, have a public vote and the public just uh, voted for which their favourite podcasts were and that one won. It was pretty simple. But it did weigh um, the awards in favour of those shows with the biggest audiences so if we were doing something like cryptozoology or aliens or something um then those kind of shows would normally win however this time what's happening is that we have the public vote as usual and then all of the shows that get shortlisted then go on to be uh, properly judged by a panel of judges for uh, mm. their content so it's not just purely about who has the most fans it's about who delivers the best show and of mm. course of course that'll be us won't it <laughs> So if you could vote for us, that'll be on uh, podcastsawards.com and all the registration details will be on there and the public voting is open for the entire month of July. So please make sure you get there and vote PaleoCast and I think we'll be going for the education category again. 
Sounds good. Sounds like a good new format. 2017 is our year. Yeah. Woo, go paleo guest. <laughs> And as always, please like, share and subscribe this episode if you've enjoyed it. And please get in touch to let us know what you thought of it. And if you have any episode requests. And I hope you enjoy this episode with Dr. Makoto Manabe. currently at the National Museum of Nature and Science in Tokyo, and I am speaking with the Director of Collections, Dr. Makoto Manabe. Uh, thank you for joining me today, Makoto. Thank you, and it's my pleasure. So we are currently in the Japan Gallery, and we're going to talk a little bit about the history of Japan and paleontology in Japan. So if we can start out with you introducing yourself and telling me a bit about your background and how you got here. Okay, At, um, I was born in Tokyo and raised in Tokyo area, pretty much. <laughs> um, I did my MSc at Yale, uh, New Haven, Connecticut, and a PhD at University of Bristol, UK. Uh, my PhD thesis was um, ichthyosaurus and mm -hmm. uh, aquatic adaptation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I finished that in 1994, and I was lucky enough to get a job here at the museum right away. So I've been curators of fossil reptiles and birds mm -hmm. um, here at the museum for many years. And uh, uh, starting last year, I got a new job, which is uh, di director of collections. And it means everything beyond <laughs> geology. So I have to know a little bit about zoology and botany mm -hmm. and uh, physical anthropology <laughs> and uh, history of science. So I have to deal with trains and automobiles and airplanes and rockets and things like that. So quite different <laughs> from most paleontology curators. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so I guess one of the reasons that I really wanted to talk to you uh, about kind of paleontology in Japan is that most people, I don't think, recognize how much paleontology there is in Japan and don't really understand sort of the background. So can you talk a little bit about kind of the geological history of Japan and how it became this archipelago today? Mm -hmm. um, when I was doing uh, graduate studies in US or UK, many people said, oh, I thought Japan was entirely volcanic. Mm. And are there any fossils? And they, yes, there are. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are volcanic igneous rocks, but uh, there are quite few sedimentary rocks. At, um, and the Japan was not archipelago islands um, until mid Miocene. Okay. And before that, Japan was a part of Asian continent. So okay. Japan was as if at the edge of um, the big Asian continent. So um, most of the um, most of the area facing to the Pacific today, it's um, so eastern part is mm -hmm. uh, very marine sediments. Mm -hmm. And uh, and if you go to towards China and Korea, the bit. Um, a little bit of um, non-marine okay. uh, sediments. And uh, the oldest fossils um, to date in Japan is Old Bishan. Mm -hmm. And it's a conodon, so obviously marine mm -hmm. uh, area. And, uh, and on top of that, trilobites and uh, uh, corals and brachiopods. And so it's quite a variety of fossils here, and uh, starting from... Um, Old Bishan and onwards. So do these marine fossils occur all over the country or are they mostly in one area? Yeah, it's a good pe uh, Paleozoic uh, fossils are uh, coming from uh, northern Honshu. It's a Japan as if you look at the map, it's a Hokkaido is big northern island. Mm -hmm. And the mainland Honshu is sort of long island mm -hmm. from north to south. And uh, Shikoku is small island and the Kyushu is a southern um, island, so mm -hmm. four ma major islands. And, but uh, uh, Honshu is main uh, elongated island, and the northern Honshu and the uh, eastern side is uh, where most of the Paleozoic fossils are. Okay. 
And obviously, I'm looking at a, a lot of trilobite fossils and, and various kind of coral marine fossils. Mm -hmm. So are they mostly invertebrates, or do you also get Paleozoic vertebrates? Uh, Paleozoic is mainly invertebrates. Mm -hmm. So interesting thing is uh, it's uh, most of the good Pale Paleozoic fossils are from northern, eastern Honshu. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, as you saw, it's brachiopods and trilobites and corals and many, majority of them are marine mm -hmm. um, organisms. But uh, we do have uh, plant materials, so it's, uh, um, there are extensive forests mm. in, in Devonian forest and Permian forest uh, in Japan and in the, in the vicinity. But having said that, it's... Uh, um, Japan was a part edge of the Asian continent, mm -hmm. so it's obviously uh, we do have no marine uh, the terrestrial area and mm -hmm. marine area. Mm -hmm. yeah. So these plant fossils are actually from terrestrial sediments, or are these things that have kind of fallen into less terrestrial, more marine, and been preserved, or are these actual terrestrial sediments? These are Permian and some of the Devonian um, the plant materials. I think it's uh, it's come from more terrestrial okay. uh, part of mm. the, the formations. And then, of course, moving out of the Paleozoic, uh, there's also quite an extensive bit of Mesozoic fossils, both mer or both. Um, invertebrate and vertebrate and marine mm -hmm. and terrestrial. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about this, what we're standing in front of, which is uh, an ichthyosaur called mm -hmm. Utatsosaurus. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a bit about this significance? Yeah, this is uh, one of the uh, early Triassic ichthyosaurs, and um, ichthyosaurs appeared um, in geologic history from the early Triassic, so this is one of the earliest mm. at um, extrasaurs, and uh, it's uh, extensively studied by Ryosuke Motani of mm -hmm. University of California, and uh, he um, recognized um, if you look at typical um, extrasaurs, mm -hmm. it's um, um, pelvis is already uh, separated from backbones, mm -hmm. but uh, here it's um, this pelvis of the Tatsasaurus is still articulated mm. with vertebral column, so which is, has a more terrestrial um, okay. um, association. And of course, the, there was a, uh, the Tatsasaurus was tipped at swimming ichthyosaurus, mm. but uh, still has um, sort of um, remains of um, uh, terrestrial ancestor. Mm. Yeah. So how big would this animal have been? Um, that's the biggest one is 1.5 meter or okay. two meters, less than two meters. But it's not actually that big. Mm -hmm. So I guess when I think of a lot of ichthyosaurs, mm -hmm. they're often quite a bit larger. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. did they start out smaller and then grow bigger through time? Yeah, but the interesting thing is um, you know, you, you're originally from Canada, mm -hmm. and you might have heard of Shawnee-saurus mm -hmm. or Shasta-saurus yep. from uh, Upper Triassic, and they are They're gigantic. Big, aren't they? And yeah. uh, you know, it's a um, uh, there are discussion about how long or how big they were, but uh, you know, any estimates, it's it's more than 15 meters, hmm. five meters, hmm. and if not 20 meters. Wow. And those gigantic ones appeared in Triassic. Huh. So they started out as small animals in Triassic, but within Triassic they, they achieved gigantism. I see. And then I think they changed um, the mainstream evolution is toward smaller, fast swimming hmm. um, animals, mm -hmm. and then Jurassic ones, mm -hmm. as if you know the Holtz modern or British yes. extra yep. and, and those are two to five meters body length, and it's a fast hmm. swimmers. Interesting. And yeah, so it's um, so Triassic. It's obviously it's not only Japan, but uh, mm. there are a lot happening yeah. in, the, in the evolution of marine reptiles.
So are there other marine reptiles from the Triassic, other ichthyosaurs or anything like that in Japan, or is this kind of the only one? Uh, there are some, but uh, <clears throat> these Utatosaurus is one of the most complete okay. animals, so it's, um, that's, that's um, one of the best examples mm. of um, Triassic fossils, vertebrate fossils mm. from here. And are the fossils preserved in three dimension or are they, they look kind of flattened? Yeah, it's <laughs> totally flattened. Okay. So there are many studies how to retro deform yep. the fossils because obviously if you, uh, I think it's true for every fossils, mm. but uh, the, these are really compressed. Mm. And uh, if you look at ichthyosaurus, it's um, the vertebral centrum is sort of round mm -hmm. and um, so round shape and uh, and these fossils obviously it's squashed mm. and so you can somehow uh, uh, retro deform yeah. the shape and yeah. and uh, by look by looking at the vertebral column and uh, they they you can have some information about the retro rest retro retro uh, retro deformation mm -hmm. uh, of other part of the animal mm. too. The skull is obviously compressed. Yes, the, yeah. that skull looks very squashed. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so, are there other examples of marine reptiles from other parts of the Mesozoic or from other parts of Japan yeah. that are maybe a bit better preserved or different animals as yeah. well? It's um, now <clears throat> we can go to the Cretaceous mm -hmm. and uh, Futaba saurus suzuki is uh, elasmosaurid plesiosaurus and ah. it's quite a complete animal for Japan mm -hmm. and uh, we are standing in front of the reconstructed skeleton mm -hmm. of the Futaba saurus and uh, these are how um, the fossil was uh, discovered and we made, they made a cast of the specimen still in the rocks mm. and uh, then obviously you had some, had to, they had to do a preparation and isolated um, the bones mm -hmm. out of the matrix and uh, studied it and uh, made into the reconstructed skeleton. Um, this is one of the most complete plesiosaurs from Japan mm -hmm. or um, Asia. Okay. And, um, and, but uh, um, the cervical vertebrae wasn't um, completely um, preserved. Okay. So uh, this is based on typical elasmosaurid, but um, it could be much, it's much longer mm. neck or shorter neck. So this particular skeleton is about body length is estimated about seven meters in okay. length, but uh, it could be nine meters okay. or slightly shorter, say six meters. Mm -hmm. So elasmosaurids are known for having a very long neck, right? Yes. So with this reconstruction, mm -hmm. did you just do it based on something closely related or mm -hmm. just kind of an average of lengths of animals this size or how did you decide how long you thought it would be? Yeah, this one is um, sort of, um, of course, uh, so we chose, um, we try to base our estimate estimates on the cro closely related species mm -hmm. and also um, we didn't assume any extra long neck or okay. extra short neck. Yeah. So kind of average. Mm -hmm. So where in Japan was Futabasaurus found? This is from uh, Fukushima Prefecture. So okay. again, northern Honshu okay. and the uh, east side of Japan. And I can see from the sort of cast of how it was found that it's still in somewhat, you know, it's somewhat articulated mm. and also 3D. Is it? common for animals in that area to be found with that sort of preservation? Yeah, I think it's, um, with that service, the Triassic yeah. extrasource was badly crashed. Yeah. So this is um, more typical okay. of Japanese uh, vertebrate fossils. Okay. 
So they're actually, in general, quite well preserved compared mm -hmm. to the Utatsosaurus that we mm -hmm. just saw. And I can see that this one has a skull. Mm -hmm. I think skulls are not all that common with plesiosaurs, are they? Right, because um, extras, um, plesiosaurs, yeah, plesiosaurs tend to have long neck. Yes. And it's, uh, it's flexible long necks and um, obviously the, the head the skull is quite flexible mm -hmm. to, to in, in terms of movement. So, you know, when, when it's fossilized, it's usually disarticulated. Mm -hmm. right? And so that you, you, as you know, there are many headless yes. or neckless <laughs> um, plesiosaurs. Yeah. Mm. So this um, particular fossil was um, found in 1968 mm -hmm. by high school student ah. and, and so this young man being prospecting for fossils in his hometown area mm -hmm. in Fukushima in northern Honshu and uh, there was a river cup outcrop and he recognized some of the um, vertebrae uh -huh. that was eroded to the face of the, this outcrop mm -hmm. and, and then he started, he invited scientists from this museum, National Museum of Nature and Science, and they started extensive um, search mm -hmm. uh, of the outcrop and uh, they found the skull and already at that stage the posterior part brain case was gone due uh. to the ero erosion by the river. Okay. But uh, they, they have quite a nice snout. Yeah. And, uh, the orbit and snout part, but um, we don't have um, the brain case and uh, uh, most of the neck. Yeah. yeah. Terribly <laughs> sorry. It's such a noise because <laughs> we are here on Monday, and uh, Monday it's, the museum is closed to the public on Mondays. And uh, but and I thought it's quiet <laughs> to talk to you, and uh, we have we have an entire gallery to ourselves. <laughs> but at the same time, the many maintenance work is being carried out. Uh, I'm terribly sorry about that. It's, that's uh, okay. We had a, a, a Evo Devo mm -hmm. uh, exhibition mm -hmm. until yesterday, and they are deinstalling the mm -hmm. exhibition and clean up the special exhibition rooms. And I think yeah. that's just below us, isn't below it? Below us, yeah. yes, yes. <laughs> and also, it's, um, we had a National Natural History Museum London exhibition. Yes. It was quite a spectacular, popular yes. exhibition. That's also ended yesterday. Yes. So, so it's a lot, lot of work is going uh -huh. on. Yes. We got to witness the um, packing up of Archaeopteryx yeah. this morning. Yeah. First yeah. time it's traveled. Mm -hmm. so. That was exciting. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, uh, we had a we had an exhibition on uh, with that Natural History Museum London exhibition. We, we introduced Mary Anning, of mm. course, and uh, and um, some of the specimens she collected. Mm -hmm. We didn't have plesiosaurs on display, but uh, as as we all know, it's um, she was a fun. She was the one who found the first complete. Ichthyosaurus mm -hmm. and plesiosaurus. Yes. So, so Japanese uh, Mary Anning was a high school <laughs> boy. <laughs> so was that the first plesiosaur that was found in Japan? No, it wasn't the first, but okay. the first complete. The first, uh, ones. okay. Uh, before that, it, there was a paper written about isolated uh, okay. specimens. Okay. And so we knew ichthyosaurus and plesiosaurus existed yeah. um, in Japan, but uh, this was <coughs> the first complete one. Mm. And so this is um, one of the best known mm -hmm. um, vertebrate fossils mm -hmm. in, from Japan. Okay. Yeah. So if we move back towards the other Mesozoic fossils, because it's not just marine fossils, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So so we do have dinosaurs and uh, other plants and of mm -hmm. course but the dinosaurs um, we have quite a variety of fossils and uh, as if you follow dinosaurs it's there are um, fu fu uh, the fukui saurus and fukui raptor mm -hmm. fukui venator mm -hmm. koshi saurus 
and uh, Tamba Titanus and the Koshi Saras and so there are um, quite few named mm. uh, dinosaur specimen and again it's mainly from uh, western part okay. of Japan which is um, more inland mm. of Japan and uh, they're quite terrestrial area and um, and then also plant uh, fossils mm -hmm. too. So the dinosaur fossils, are they also Cretaceous, like the Futabasaurus, or are mm -hmm. they kind of a variety of ages? It's um, everything reported up to today is the dinosaurs from Japan are mainly Cretaceous, okay. all Cretaceous actually. And the majority of them um, named species um, early Cretaceous, mm -hmm. but uh, now it's, uh, there are some new fossils being uh, excavated from ah. Hokkaido and the Upper Cretaceous. Uh -huh. I think just a couple of weeks ago there was something in the paper or something in the news about a new dinosaur being found on Hokkaido. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's Hadrosaurid dinosaur. Ah, okay. and, uh, Again, um, many of the Japanese dinosaurs are fragmentary, mm -hmm. and, but uh, this um, Hadrosaurid from Hokkaido, it's, um, Yoshitsugu Kobayashi is a leading scientist for this project, mm -hmm. but he says it's about 70 or 80 percent complete. Oh, wow. So they, they have a skull and, uh, you know, Four legs and two and the tail. So wow! Spectacular specimen. Yeah, so, that's exciting. Yeah. How long would something like that take to excavate here? It's um, it takes long because the sediments, the rocks, are um, much harder oh, and okay. it's more difficult to prepare. Okay. And I think it's mainly because of the, the it's more um, heavy tectonic. Um, influence mm. on the rocks here in comparison to say Mongolia mm. or uh, Canada mm -hmm. or uh, Western US mm -hmm. so the rocks are harder mm. so, so that that is um, the problem it's we that's, um, have a hard time to preparing the fossil out okay. from the matrix mm. how does the sort of fossil collecting law work here? Like if somebody finds mm. something, do they have to report it? Or is it like in the US where if they find it, they can keep it if it's on their land? Or how does it kind of work? I, I think if it's in your own land, then uh, you have a right to keep it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't have any particular international laws. Mm -hmm. Uh, preventing you from selling it to overseas or bringing it out to overseas. Okay. Um, but um, many of the um, area is protected by some of the okay. laws. And so uh, before even um, go and um, dig something out, you have to apply for the you permission. Permits. And, uh, from um, depends on where you are and, and the site, but uh, you have to submit your proposal or permission uh, ap application mm -hmm. to the board of education or village or town. Okay. And usually they um, have a consulting scientist, and so it's our muse local museum, and they review your application or. Um, Proposal and okay. decide if it's okay to do a prospecting and digging. Yeah. yeah. We talked about big dinosaurs and plagiarism house, and uh, maybe uh, Japan is famous for ammonites. Yes. And, uh, ammonites are from not everywhere, but uh, famous, uh, many famous sites from mm -hmm. Hokkaido and Honshu and um, southern islands of Japan too. But uh, those um, abnormally uncoiled yes. uh, ammonites are famous for uh, Japan. Of course, there are from, from North America too, but um, Japan has peculiar uh, ammonites. Yeah, I think yeah. I had seen pictures of 
kind of uncoiled or strangely shaped ammonites mm -hmm. before, but I've never seen as many as what I'm looking <laughs> at right now and as many different shapes. Yeah. yeah. So are these Cretaceous as well? Yes, or? yes, okay. mainly Cretaceous. There are, are Triassic and Jurassic ammonites, but uh, um, the Cretaceous ammonites are spectacular. So is there any particular reason why these morphologies of ammonites are really common in Japan rather than in other places? Good question. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's a, just thinking about it. These start to evolve towards the, towards the end of okay. Cretaceous, so, so obviously, you know, at some, so you don't see them in Jurassic or mm -hmm. earlier sediments. So, so you won't see them in the UK. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, if you have a good um, late Cretaceous um, exposure, and, mm. uh, that you have you you have more chance. Okay. Yeah, my favorite is uh, this is I know very little about <laughs> invertebrate paleontology. <laughs> it's, it's quite um, it's uh, it's quite I shouldn't say this, but <laughs> 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 to be honest, <laughs> this is a type of oyster, and it's. Uh, Combostrea is a um, gen genetic name, and uh, this is again from Upper Cretaceous of Northern Honshu and uh, Hokkaido. Mm -hmm. And um, you know what? There are many oysters and today, and you go and uh, you looked at oysters and oyster bars and mm -hmm. restaurants. But uh, this one is quite elongated, and yes. some some of them some of them is like nearly one meter in length. And it's strangely sh shaped, uh, elongated oysters. And uh, it's, uh, from what I understand, is uh, the sedimentation is so fast. And, uh, and, and in those areas, uh, some of these oysters um, um, adapted to grow and, um, and elongate. And the shells, it's amazing. Yeah, they look very different from any oyster I've ever seen. <laughs> um, are these kind of oysters, um, you might not know this, but are they found elsewhere or is this something that's only in Japan from what you know? Um, I only know it's, it's quite um, um, rare so okay. that, uh, you know, Japan is famous for that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't know it's, uh, how much uh, fossils being reported <laughs> from outside of Japan. And I now see right underneath it is the first dinosaur discovered in Japan. Yes, that was a humerus, a fragmentary humerus of um, sauropod dinosaurs. That was in uh, 1978. Okay. And uh, the invertebrate paleontologist was uh, doing a field work in northern Honshu, mm -hmm. and uh, he was there looking at early Cretaceous rocks, and uh, and they're staying at the uh, inn and bed and breakfast mm -hmm. in the area. And one morning they're just you know looking at outside of the window and a view of the um, cliff in front of the the bed and breakfast, and they recognize some wood shaped chunk huh. is sitting in the <laughs> in the formation and uh, and uh, they recognize they, they first thought it's a wood yeah but uh, it turned out to be bones and <laughs> they they uh, this uh, invertebrate paleontologist telephoned vertebrate pale paleontologist back in tokyo and um, asked for instructions and, uh, <laughs> And uh, this is at some um, remote area, so uh, they didn't have particular, you know, specialist glue or something. Yeah. So they went outside, went to a stationery store nearby, and, and oh, no. renewed, uh, bought a bunch of uh, ordinary uh, glue, <laughs> and uh, they they diluted it to, into the water okay. and uh, made made it uh, more liquid <laughs> uh, glue, and uh, applied it all over the bones and. Uh, and 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 then lifted from the huh. article. Yeah. So 1978. <coughs> so not that long ago for no, the first no. dinosaur fossil. No, and uh, I, I think we didn't um, expect to have um, big vertebrate fossils mm. from uh, Japan and especially Mesozoic ones. Mm -hmm. So people uh, didn't expect. So they didn't 
spent enough time uh, or and made an effort to yeah. find it. But after this sauropod was reported, then people started to pay attention. Mm. And so now it's, uh, we have dinosaur fossils from Hokkaido to Kyushu, mm -hmm. and not every you know, prefecture, but mm -hmm. uh, more than um, 19 prefectures. Wow. And, and so it's, it's quite uh, good. And it's, um, as you mentioned, it's, uh, there is, was a report of new hadrosaurid mm. um, from, from Hokkaido, and it's uh, very complete ones. So, so still being found, you know, mm -hmm. frequently. Yeah, yeah, not, yeah. Not a so rare... it's getting there, yeah. Oh, yeah that's yeah. exciting. Yeah, just uh, uh, a week ago, it's um, uh, the egg shell fossils ah, uh, yes. from, from uh, uh, Western Honshu. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, that was sort of, you know, it's uh, sitting in somebody's house for uh. Uh, nearly... 40 years wow. and, and uh, then it's it's most most likely a, a dinosaur mm -hmm. eggs and uh, eggshells wow. so uh, it, the, the eggshells was probably it's found much earlier than this sauropod yeah so, so if you look at look back at uh, maybe there are more yeah you know it's a hidden <laughs> specimens some. yeah, yeah. Well. I guess now we can move to the Cenozoic because yes. there's also fossils <laughs> from the Cenozoic. Yeah. It's got so all major time except not pre-Cambrian, I guess, mm -hmm. but I guess so, yeah. Huh. Yeah. So, um about 20 to 15, 15 million years ago, mm -hmm. that the Sea of Japan was formed, mm -hmm. so Japan became the archipelago, mm -hmm. so separated from the continent. So at um, so before that, the Mesozoic and Paleozoic Japan was a part of the continent, mm -hmm. and now in the, after Miocene, it's uh, Japan became the continent. So that's made a big difference. Mm. And so there's. Obviously, I'm looking at a lot of very nicely preserved plant fossils. So you've got plant fossils, you have some mammal fossils mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, I see also marine, so you've got all the different kind of realms of uh, Cenozoic fossils as well. Yeah, That's, uh, if you're a vertebrate paleontologist, probably you've heard of uh, Desmostylians mm -hmm. and the Paleoparadoxia, those aquatic uh, mammals. It's only found that those their fossils are only found in Japan or North America, mm. and it's um it's looks like hippopotamus or something. Yeah. It's a quadrupedal um, uh, marine mammals, <laughs> and but it's the teeth are quite unique in shape and uh, and it's as if those tabular shape. Um, units are oh, formed yeah. into uh, a tooth into a molar, and uh, so that that type of teeth is, is quite identifiable. And so um, the animal is so different from what you see today. And yeah. So it's obviously they became extinct uh, without leaving any descendants to hmm. today. So those teeth are like s kind of single cylinders of tooth put together to make almost one continuous mm -hmm. long tooth. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. I, I don't know very much about mammal paleontology, I will admit. <laughs> um, and I hadn't realized that before. That's yeah, really yeah, weird. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, there are, at, of course, it's, uh, they, they are quite uh, diverse mm -hmm. in... in, in, in uh, um, biodiversity wise and species diversity wise and and um, so they are quite different and some 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 uh, scientists argue some uh, desmostylians use these teeth for grinding hmm. um, soft plants mm -hmm. uh, material under the water and some some 
some species use more suction feeding type of things. <laughs> so it's, uh, they're, they're quite um, strange looking. Yes, uh, yeah, they are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so how long have these been known in Japan for? When were these first kind of discovered? I think it's, um, um, I don't remember offhand, but uh, it's been um, uh, reported for many years. As, as before well. dinosaurs? Before dinosaurs, yeah. obviously, and yeah. uh, they're quite uh, strange. Mm. Yeah. But also, I mean, looking at this one skeleton, mm -hmm. um, it looks quite complete. So, you know, most of the animal is known as well. So that's kind of nice to see mm -hmm. a whole skeleton. Mm -hmm. and yeah, it's, uh, even these, um, we were just talking about uh, teeth. Its mm -hmm. teeth are quite different, but uh, there are big um, debates and there are, there are many studies how they walked or puddled, mm. how they used their uh, limbs and how they um, held their body and there were many discussions mm. and, uh, so if you you know go into the web or a textbook there are a series of different uh, reconstructions. Mm. Mm. Is there a kind of um, consensus today or a, a main thought of how they yeah. did it? Yeah, I think so. I think <laughs> so. It's interesting. Ah. And uh, there are ice age and yes. uh, and those time it's um, sea level was mm -hmm. low. So Japan was reconnected I see. with the rest of the continent and uh, um, there are, on those days, there are um, elephants uh, from uh, the Asian continent moved into Japan from the south, walked to Japan from the south, and also some woolly mammoths coming from the north to Japan. And so there are southern migration and northern migration. And um, it, it's Again, you know, that um, you know woolly mammoths and things like that from Siberia mm -hmm. and, and, and some relative thing from North America. But, uh, you know, you'd assume Japan has been island and, uh, yeah. and then you don't, you know, if you didn't know about it, you don't expect to see the um, elephant mm. um, fossils from Japan. But they're, they're quite diverse ones and uh, from Japan and also other like um, deer and other mammals mm. are found in Japan and also also it's uh, if you look at the cave deposit it's small mammals oh, yeah uh, yeah and uh, and bats and things like that how old are these kind of cave type deposits? It um, it's can be quite old, but uh, um, the youngest one is ob obviously um, 20,000 years. Okay. Um, ago. Still not that young, though. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and there are some of them much older. And uh, there is um, the recent um, project here at the museum is when and how people came to Japan mm. and uh, uh, there, are, there are hypotheses it's um, from China and Taiwan it's uh, uh, they used some kind of boats and then and, and, and across the water the sea mm -hmm. and came to Japan and probably island hopping from Okinawa Islands to mm -hmm. Kyushu and, uh, hmm. uh, so these kind of cave deposits are found all over the country as well? I think it's mainly from um, Okinawa and okay. uh, those islands. Okay. And, and it's because they are limestone islands and uh, there's, uh, there's okay. a fissure and cave and those, those yeah. breakage as a space between yeah. the uh, limestone and then the newer sediments fall, uh, fell in mm -hmm. to those gaps. Mm. 
That was very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously we're talking today because last week you were uh, at the annual kind of Japanese paleontology meeting. Yes. So how many paleontologists are there in Japan? Um, maybe a professional mm -hmm. ones like like uh, those who are working at the university and museums, maybe somewhere around 200, 300, okay. something like that. Yeah. And, and, and there are more students mm -hmm. and then amateur paleontologists. Uh, the Paleontological Society of Japan has more than 1,000 membership. Wow. So <laughs> I, I, I know the exact number because I uh, sat <laughs> in the meeting at the uh, General Assembly just a few <laughs> days ago. It's 1,008 members. Uh, and wow. in, in addition to that, we have a sort of friends of the Paleontological Society. That's, mm -hmm. uh, I should say friends of paleontology. <laughs> it's about 300 Okay. Uh, people and uh, that's uh, it's children and um, quite old and mm -hmm. retired people and mm -hmm. it's a mixture but I was quite impressed with um, younger ones mm -hmm. because I sat next to um, second grade um, boys just um, <laughs> yesterday and uh, they are the members of the friends of the paleontology mm -hmm. and uh, and they can go and listen to the to the scientific oh, technical wow. sessions, and this and uh, this um, seven years old boy uh, sat through the entire entire morning session wow. and taking notes, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, I met I ran into another uh, seven years old boy. It's um, and he was take he uh, listened to. Silicons, hmm. um, the biology of silicons and fossil record, and it was a public talk. But um, he th sat through one hour lecture and took note and maybe five pages in notes. And wow. at the end, he asked a question <laughs> and said, "So, how many silicons that's known to science?" <laughs> and <laughs> and wow. I, I didn't know that. And it uh, seems like 140 species <laughs> and. Uh, and, and it's it's amazing, you know. Yeah. There are only two species today. Yes. But uh, you know, if you include all the uh -huh. um, um, named species, that's um, it's more than hundred, you know. <laughs> and uh, so, and uh, in at uh, this speaker, uh, Dr. Yabumoto from Kitakyushu Museum, didn't mention that at in his lecture. And yeah. He, um, and he had uh, uh, the phylogeny and uh, and uh, stratocladogram mm -hmm. and he mentioned many names of course but the, the boy just mm -hmm. not and how many he wanted species. to know how many <laughs> <laughs> that was a good that was a really good question so <laughs> so it's uh, so i don't know it's um um how many uh, people in in um british or canadian societies do you know so in the Canadian Society of Vertebrate Paleo, which is very new, mm -hmm. um, their annual meetings have maybe 40 people, mm -hmm. but it's only been going now three mm -hmm. or four years. Mm -hmm. um, the British one is more. Um, I don't know how many members, but the meeting would be similar, maybe mm -hmm. like 300 mm -hmm. people kind of thing. Um, I know... SVPCA, which is um, vertebrate paleo and comparative mm -hmm. anatomy, has mm -hmm. typically maybe 120 or 150 people at it. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, I think of there being a very large British paleontology mm -hmm. community, but it seems like Japan has a much bigger one. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, the, uh, the society was uh, was uh, once has. 1,008 members mm. uh, covering the entire paleontology, mm -hmm. so not only vertebrate, yeah. um, paleobotany and invertebrate mm -hmm. and micro paleontologists, so it's, um, it's entirely paleontology. And there are, um, made, there are many suggestions um, maybe that they should make a vertebrate paleontology society mm -hmm. of Japan mm -hmm. and uh, but and uh, uh, 
we talked about it and there may be 200 300 membership yeah and or maybe it could be more yeah but it's um it's still um um not enough uh, members mm. so that's uh, we uh, decided to uh, work as uh, entire A paleontology because um i don't know it's um the situation surrounding paleontology in Canada or UK. Mm. Um, I lived in um, UK for four years mm -hmm. and, and in the US four years, and I did the junior year abroad in Canada, mm -hmm. Saskatchewan, <laughs> University of Saskatchewan, <laughs> long time ago. Uh. But it's uh, you know pa paleontology is so popular yes. here because dinosaurs and barges shale yep. and um, and and trilobites and ammonites they're yes. so popular so uh, there are many people that are interested in paleontology in this country so whenever we have exhibitions special exhibitions you know, dinosaur exhibitions mm -hmm. or um, um, diversity of life introducing burgess shale mm -hmm. and uh, change and fauna and etc et we, we attract many people mm. but um, um, the number of um, students taking geology at high school is had decreased okay and then and maybe because of that that the number of people um, pursuing studying mm. geology paleontology in undergraduates much Have less decreased so so in for the future of paleontology mm. in Japan, we need to encourage yes. uh, more people uh, yeah. to go to study uh, paleontology in university level. Mm. And so that's, I don't know, it's a, is that um, um, is a similar situation, do you think, in UK, Canada? Not in the UK. In the UK, they have problems with too many people doing maybe not undergrad, but mm -hmm. doing um, graduate studies. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so there's so many people who want to do a master's or a PhD, mm -hmm. and there are so few jobs that mm -hmm. it's very problematic. Mm -hmm. So I would imagine undergrad would be similar. It mm -hmm. seems like a lot of people really want to study it. Mm -hmm. um, in Canada, I know that geology has decreased a little bit since the price of oil went down. Right. Um, so there used to be a lot of people who would go into geology to mm -hmm. get a job with an oil company, mm -hmm. but that some universities have had major problems bringing students in mm -hmm. um, since the oil price has decreased. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how that's affected paleontology, though, because mm -hmm. so where I did my undergrad um, in Alberta, I actually did my BSc in paleontology. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't geology and it wasn't biology, it was actually paleontology. Nice. Um, so nice. I don't know how those numbers will have changed, mm -hmm. but I know that kind of general geology has mm -hmm. gone down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, um, I didn't mention the, the most um, the important issue just you raised a moment ago. It's uh, um, the university here is, um, um, making an effort to strengthen the postgraduate so graduate schools yes and uh, i think we attracted enough number of students um, coming to paleontology uh, but um, the jobs are quite limited and yes. so obviously uh, there are many universities in japan and uh, there are many museums but uh, job opportunities are not increasing yes so, so it's, a, it's a big gap yes There's a number of uh, graduate students um, you know, graduating from mm. paleontology and um, less postdoc opportunities mm -hmm. and much much less yes job opportunities so we have to change that yes yeah we paleontologists tend to say oh we are so popular so it's uh, we need to create more jobs yes and and but uh, it's not it's not easy no. <laughs> for obvious reasons but, so uh, how many universities are there that you could study paleontology if you wanted to in japan that's a good question but um, maybe 
fifty or oh, five wow. zero okay. university. That's including it's and you know everything yes. invertebrate. Yeah. Um, you know, invertebrate mm -hmm. and micro paleontology. <laughs> there, there are quite few. Yeah. Uh, but again, that's um, I was talking to many university professors at a conference yesterday, the mm -hmm. day before yesterday. It's um, the population is decreasing in, yes. in Japan, so it's a uh, university. Um, has a um, hard time to securing enough number of good students mm. so, and uh, government is uh, trying to encourage some universities focus on more in education than um, research mm -hmm. and so that changes uh, the environment for the Universities in the older yeah. days, you know, it's uh, there are many top research universities and and more smaller universities and or or uh, universities for training um, students to become high school, mm. uh, primary school uh, teachers. Mm -hmm. But e even those um, um, departments, they are keen to do research, mm. and, and and that's been working uh, well, but. Uh, now the government is giving pressure that you should, you know, your, your university or department should focus more on education. Mm. So less, less uh, priority for researchers. Yes. So, huh. mm -hmm. Well, that's really interesting. Thank you very much, Makoto. Um, I have learned a lot about Japanese paleontology <laughs> and hopefully this will get people interested in, in paleo in Japan. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Paleocast was brought to you by Dave Marshall, with Joe Keating, Laura Sol, Liz Martin Silverstone, and Caitlin Colary. It was made possible by funding from the Paleontological Society and the Paleontological Association, but the show now relies on contributions from you, the listeners. If you've liked this episode, please consider donating, and thanks to everyone that's helped out so far. We'd also like to thank the Ocean Collective for use of their music. Please visit paleocast.com for the supplementary material to this episode and for our archive of past programmes. Subscribe to our Twitter feed at Paleocast and like us at facebook.com forward slash Paleocast to get all the latest news.